Hello, my dear sewing friends, it's Elisa here. And as you know, on my channel, I do have a video series where we dive deep and detailed into different techniques. We've discussed how to finish different seams, how to finish different hems and when to use them, how to finish different armholes and necklines on woven garments. So today I would love to take the same approach, but talk about a very specific topic, which can be a little bit intimidating at times, and that is how to finish knit necklines. I have four different ways that I prefer to do that. As always, I'll be sharing with you what I do, what works for me, and why I do it step by step. Not to mention that I have a ton of real life examples, so that way you can really see how I personally apply all of these techniques in my own sewing. So without any further ado, Let's get started. Now first, let's go ahead and talk about how to finish neatly very simple neckline where you have a neck band that will apply to the round neck and to the v-neck as well. I have three different ways how you can do it. Two of them are my preferred and the third one I'm not really a big fan of, but I just want to show you how to do it so that way you can really choose what works best for you. Now I have two very detailed tutorials about how to attach a round neckline to a knit garment and a V neckline as well with all the tips and tricks, ins and outs and all of the secrets that you will need to know. So right now we're gonna go through that rather quickly. I'm starting with a ribbing for the neckline but you can also use a self fabric as well. This ribbing is cut to about 20 to 25% shorter than the actual length of the neckline. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to notch the front and the back at the center. For the neckline, the first step would be to place it right sides together and sew the short ends. And then, of course, notch the center front as well on both sides. And the seam is going to be our center back. I'm going to take my ribbing, fold it wrong sides together, enclosing the center back seam. I'm going to place this center back seam at the center back notch. And I'm going to start basting it with a hand sewing needle and thread all the way around, lightly stretching as I go around and baste it in. So that way we get that beautiful round neckline. Once neckline has been basted in, let's go ahead and head to the sewing machine or serger in order to attach it. When I do it on a serger, I use a four thread seam. When I do it on a sewing machine, I use a zigzag stitch. In the separate tutorial where I talk about how to attach a really neat round neckline, I give you some extra tips about pressing and how I go about that. So if you've been struggling with that, give that video a go. And I will leave that for you guys in the info box right underneath this video. Before moving on to the next step, let's go ahead and find the end of the seam and tuck in the loose threads. First technique for finishing a neckline like this would be to do top stitching. Usually it's just about one eighth of an inch away from the ribbing or the neck band and it goes all the way around the neckline, catching the seam allowance underneath which makes it lay flat plus it gives it that really nice finished look. While you can use all-purpose thread, my choice is to use Eloflex or Maroflex thread, which is a stretchy thread, not to be confused with sharing elastic. This stretchy thread allows flexibility of regular straight stitches. Now, if you are using just a regular all-purpose thread, my rule of thumb is do it on the necklines that aren't too tight, meaning you're not going to be stretching them too much when you're putting them on, plus increase the stitch length. That way, it works better. While this is my preferred method for doing this, you can of course use a number of other things like for example choosing a really shallow zigzag stitch as well. Now with the seam allowance brushed towards the body of the project, I like to stitch just about one eighth of an inch away from the joining seam between the neck band and the actual shirt. I like to start at the shoulder seam of my project because I think it just gives you a nicer, smoother sailing through the entire stitching because we're going to be doing the front and the back all in one go. Now, as I mentioned, I'm using just a regular straight stitch and Eloflex stretchy thread. Now, sometimes people will comment and say that Eloflex thread gives them a lot of troubles. And while that is not necessarily the case with me, I do find that if you do loosen up your tension just by a tiny bit, it gives you a smoother sewing with this particular thread. As always, don't forget to secure your top stitching either with a back stitch or by pulling the threads to the wrong side of the garment and tying them in knots. After you're done, go ahead and give your neckline another good press along the seam right over here. And that's it, your top stitching is done. And since I used Eloflex thread, this can be stretched without a problem. 
I want to give you an extra tip here. If you do have an edge joining or edge stitching foot, I believe that's what it's called, then it's going to change your top stitching game, not only in this instance, but in any other garment that you're going to make, woven or knit. This presser foot has a little lip that you place on one side of the seam and then your top stitch on the other. That way, the distance all the way around is super nice and even. It also makes top stitching a lot faster as well. The second method of neatly finishing round necklines at the first glance looks very much like the first one. You will see that the front looks identical, but if you take a look at the back, you will see that the seam between the neck band and the actual shirt has been enclosed. Now we're going to start with exactly the same steps as in the first instance. You're going to start with a t-shirt and a neck band and you're going to attach the two. Now, in my experience, the enclosing of the back seam is done for three major reasons. Number one, to prevent the back neckline from stretching out. Number two, for aesthetic reasons, it does look very nice. And number three, to prevent the irritation of bulky fabrics, especially when you're working with sweatshirting materials for hoodies and sweaters. For this, I'm using everything the same as we did in the first one, but add half an inch wide single fold bias tape woven that is just slightly larger than the width of the back neckline. Here at the very beginning, I want to fold in my bias tape like so, and I want to open it up. I will align the edge of the bias tape with the edge of the seam allowance that is joining the neck band and the shirt itself. Here, I only want to stitch through the seam allowance only, coming very close to the actual edge of the seam, but not past it. This is probably one of the trickiest parts of this particular technique. When you get to the other end of your back neckline, go ahead and fold in your bias tape the same way as we did in the beginning and backstitch. This is what you're going to have after this first step is done. Right now, if you'd like, you can just place your bias tape down and call the day. But I find that it's a lot easier and the result a lot cleaner if I fold the bias tape right under the seam allowance and as close as possible to it. For that, right now, my bias tape is too wide, so I will go ahead and I will trim it. After I have trimmed my bias tape, now I can fold and sort of like wrap my seam allowance in this bias tape. First, I usually go ahead and pin it, and after that is done, I usually go ahead and baste it. That provides the cleanest result of all. Once done, I'm going to complete the front neckline exactly the same way as in the first example, with Eloflex thread with straight stitch about 1 8 of an inch away from the seam that connects the ribbing with the shirt. But I'm going to do that on the front neckline only. Once I reach the shoulder seam and I'm ready to go into the back neckline, here's what I'm going to do. I will try to smoothly transition from 1 8 of an inch distance to a quarter of an inch distance for the back neckline because I'm trying to catch that seam allowance and the bias tape that we wrapped it in. Now, as you can see, I'm going very slow and very steady. This is the real speed footage of how I'm doing that, so as you can see, I'm not rushing that. Once I'm close enough to the other shoulder seam and I'm ready to finish the top stitching of the neckline, and now I will go from a quarter of an inch distance back to one eighth of an inch distance so that way I can smoothly connect the top stitching all around the neckline. Don't forget to secure this either with a back stitch or by pulling your threads to the wrong side of the garment and tying them in knots. Now let's take a look what we have. The front here looks exactly like the first technique that we completed, but let's take a look at the back. Here I really want to show you that nice and smooth transition between a quarter of an inch and one eighth of an inch width. I find that transitioning between these two is really the nicest and cleanest result that I can get when doing a back neckline like that. Now here the biggest pet peeve for me personally is to make sure that these seams look really nice and neat from both outside and inside of the garment. And if I do them in a rush, I do have to redo them. So basting and <laughs> going slow and steady really helps this case. Because this is completed with a bias tape and Eloflex thread, it still has a little bit of wiggle room. So if you stretch it, it kind of gives a little bit. 
I promise you it is easier than it seems. Just take it slow and steady, make the extra steps for that neat finish like a basting for example, and you will be good to go in no time. This next variation is going to be very similar to the one that we just did, but instead of bias tape, we're going to be using a twill tape. Now, out of all of these three variations of the first method, this is my least favorite one, and let me share with you why. Number one, twill tape is rougher to the touch, at least to me. Number two, it's also stiffer once sewn in. So if you remember when we attached bias tape to the back neckline, if you give it a little tug, it still has that flexibility. Well, that is not the case when you inserting a twill tape. And number three, I never had a luck of finding a twill tape that is less than half an inch wide, which is what I prefer when finishing the back neckline. I'm starting here with exactly the same neckline and half an inch wide twill tape. If I'm working with a sudden sleeve, then I do this from shoulder seam to shoulder seam. If I'm working with a reglan sleeve, like in this case, then I do it from the sleeve fold to the sleeve fold. Now let's go ahead and cut our twill tape a little bit longer than the final length of the back neckline where we're going to be attaching it. So that way we can account for folding the twill tape under at the beginning and at the end. Let's go ahead and fold the beginning of twill tape a little bit under. And here we're also going to be stitching on the seam allowance only, but in this case we're going to be stitching on the face side of the twill tape. So this stitch is going to be visible on the inside of your garment. You want to stitch very close to the actual seam between the neckband and the garment, but not past it, just like we did it with the bias tape. Once this is done, the twill tape is going to sit flat right away without any folding under. To finish this off, we're going to repeat exactly the same steps as in a bias tape case, but instead of going from a quarter of an inch to one eighth of an inch width, we're going to go from one eighth of an inch width to a half an inch width on the back neckline. As you can see, I could have gotten another quarter of an inch lower and caught the very edge of the twill tape, but right now we're just gonna use this to our advantage and I'm going to insert a tiny little golden label in the back neckline. So there you have it, three different and very neat ways how you can finish your knit necklines with the neckband. So next time you're sewing a t-shirt or a sweater or anything else like that, I hope you give it a try and see which one works best for you. Now for this next one, I also have a ton of examples. In fact, I'm actually wearing one. And I do love this way of finishing knit necklines because it's really easy, it's straightforward, but it doesn't give me that casual feel as the neckband usually does. So it works really great when you want the comfort of the garment that you're making, you just don't want it to feel too casual. Another reason why I really love this finishing is because then you don't have to deal with finding ribbing of the same color or the same shade. You also don't have to deal with the neckband at all because here you simply don't have it. So if you've been struggling with knit neckbands, I truly think that this might be the solution for you. I call it a fold under method. For this technique, I find that you can either use self-fabric of the project, and sometimes using fabric that is a little bit lighter works even better. For the next step, I'm going to cut a strip of fabric in the greatest direction of the stretch that is going to be just about one and a half inches wide, but you can also go for the width that you would like. The length of the strip of the fabric is going to be just about one inch shorter than the total length of the front plus the back neckline of your project. First, I'm going to place the short ends right sides together and sew them. After that, I will place it wrong sides together and give the entire neckband a really good press. Next, I'm going to attach this, so to speak, neckband onto the neckline itself. And I'm going to do that exactly the same way as you would if you were actually sewing a neckband. The only difference is that this neckband is only about one inch shorter than the total length of the back and the front neckline. Therefore, we're not going to be stretching it. And the only place where we're going to be stretching it just a tad is the dip of the front neckline. Now let's head to your sewing machine or a serger and attach this neckband to the neckline. If you're working on a sewing machine, make sure that you use a stretch stitch. Once that is done, it's going to look like this. 
It doesn't look pretty just yet, but bear with me just for a moment. Now we're going to fold this neckband under. That's the reason why I call it a fold under method. When you do that, two things that will help you. Number one, once you're folding it down, give it a really good press if your fabric allows it. And number two, when you are folding it under, make sure that you do it in such a way that the fabric of the neckband, the one that you're going to be folding under, doesn't peek out. Especially if you're using a different type of fabric like I am doing here. Once the entire neckline is done, pin it in place or baste it together whichever way is best for you. Just like in a previous top stitching, I'm going to be using Eloflex thread and I'm going to start at the shoulder seam. I'm going to be stitching about 3 8 of an inch away from the neckline itself. That will be enough in order for me to create a beautiful stitching around the neckline and catch the little neckband that we folded under. Of course, depending on the width of the neckband that you fold it under and on your personal preference, you can either stitch a little closer or a little further away from the neckline itself. Now, of course, don't forget to backstitch at the beginning and at the end or pull the threads to the wrong side of the garment and tie them in knots. And once done, give it another really good press. I don't think I have to tell you that I truly do love this technique. I've been using it for a while now. Here I have a couple examples. Let me share with you some extra tips and tricks and some extra ideas. So first of all, of course, you can do so many variations of this technique. One of them is if you have a cover stitch machine, instead of doing a straight stitch with a stretch thread on your regular sewing machine, you can do that on a cover stitch machine with a single needle, or you can also do that with a double needle or a triple needle if you have it. Now, if you don't have a cover stitch machine, but you want to have the same result like you see over here on this upcycle t-shirt, then of course you can use your twin needle as well. Now another thing to keep in mind and sort of put away in your toolbox of your sewing tips and tricks is that you can use this technique on the sleeves as well. So if you have a t-shirt or a top where you really want to have that finish all the way around, you can also use this technique on the sleeves. Now here's another one. Just right now we completed this neckline together in the round. And and as you know, when you do anything in the round, at times, depending on what you're working with and what is your experience, it can be sometimes a little bit frustrating. So you can also complete this neckline flat. And what I mean by that is that instead of sewing two shoulder seams and the neckband together, you're actually going to start by sewing only one shoulder seam and working with your neckband flat. So once you've completed all of the same steps as we did together, including a top stitching, then you will go ahead and you will assemble the other shoulder. So that might be a little bit easier, especially when you're just starting out. It might give a little bit more control because you're working in linear manner versus in the round. So try it out. Maybe that would be the solution for you. And if you are a member of this channel, first of all, thank you so, so much. That's what makes all of these tutorials possible. And I also wanted to let you know that I do have a members extra video on this exact technique, but instead of doing that in the round like we just did, we're actually doing that in a flat manner. So definitely check out your members perks and I will leave the link for that members extra video right underneath this one. I got all of these sorted out, so now let's move on to the next technique. And of course, we're talking about binding. You will often find this technique on the necklines and on the armholes of the sleeveless knit garments. Now here I have two options for you. One is really simple, really straightforward. I really love it. The other one is a little bit more complex, but still very doable. So let's go ahead and explore both of them. Here we're going to be working on the neckline and the armholes of this cotton jersey tank top. We're going to start with option number one and with the neckline. I have cut a strip of fabric here which is interlock knit but you can also use self fabric for some projects and of course ribbing as well. Now this strip of fabric is just about one and a half inches wide and for the length of it I'm using the same principle as I use for regular neck bands for t-shirts which is cutting it about 20 to 25 percent shorter than the front and the back necklines combined. 
First step for me is to place the binding right sides together with the neckline of the project and pin it all around slightly stretching just like you would do when you're sewing a regular neck band. But here we're working with a single layer only. Now then we're just going to go ahead and attach it either on the sewing machine with a zigzag or any other stretch stitch or on a serger. Now here you can see a little marks of the seams. I had to undo it because my sewing machine was skipping stitches. But once this first step is done, let me show you how I overlap the seam. So that way, once we proceed to the next step, that little part where two ends of the binding meet looks really nice and neat. Now let's head to the ironing table and let's give it a really good press. Here I want to go ahead and press my seam allowances up. So you brush your seam allowances up, then give your fabric a really good press if your fabric allows it. And then we're going to wrap that seam allowance with the binding that we just attached, sort of like you would do with a bias tape. As you can see here, I am wrapping that seam allowance in the binding, sort of molding it around the neckline. And again, I'm going to give it a really good press. Usually for the next step, you can either pin it all together or I choose to baste it all together because it really does make life a little bit easier. As you can see here, I'm basting it from the right side of the project. So that way I can also make sure that the binding looks even all the way around. Now on the wrong side of the fabric, you will have quite a bit of the binding left over, but don't you worry about that. Once we complete this next step, we're going to take care of it. For the final touch, I'm going to top stitch the binding on the right side of the project, just on the very edge of the binding itself. I'm using Aloflex thread and a straight stitch. But of course, if you'd like, you can use a single needle on your cover stitch machine, maybe even double needle if you would like to, or a double needle on your regular sewing machine as well. There's another option. If you would like, you can also do a stitch in a ditch. That way there will be no visible stitching on the binding itself. After I have completed stitching of the entire neckline, I will go ahead and I will trim the excess fabric on the wrong side of the garment. Here I'm cutting close to the stitching line but not past it. As a reminder, this method will work best for knit fabrics that don't fray, which is most knits. But nowadays, sometimes I do come across knit fabrics that do fray. So just keep that in mind. And that's it. The first method is done. I think that option number one of this method is really easy and really straightforward. Now let's take a look at option number two and we're going to be working on the armholes. Everything stays the same. I'm using the same strip of binding and I also cut it about 20 to 25% shorter than the total length between the front and the back armhole. The only difference this time is that I'm actually going to be placing right side of the binding to the wrong side of the garment. I'm starting my binding at the side seam on the bottom of the armhole and I'm using the same overlap method as we did for the neckline. Once you have pinned your binding to the armhole, let's go ahead and attach it. Once done, it will look like so. And here, the first step is going to be exactly the same as previously. I'm going to brush the seam allowance up and then I'm going to take the binding, I'm going to fold it in once and then I will fold it in one more time covering the seam that attached the binding to the armhole in the first place. We're going to fold this binding like so along the entire armhole. Here I'm also basting it together before the final step, which is going to be exactly the same as an option number one, which was stitching the binding down on the very edge of the binding itself. As always, I'm using the same Eloflex thread, same straight stitch, and we're going to do that all the way around the entire armhole. As we folded the binding in, we don't need to trim anything, and once it's done, it's done. And that's it, our top with using two different binding techniques is done. Now, as you can tell, I added a little glittery vinyl to sort of uh, jazz it up a little bit. And let me know which one of these techniques you like best, the first one for the neckline or the second one for the armholes. Now that that is done, let's go ahead and move on to the next technique, which you don't really see often, at least I haven't seen it people use too often, but I truly think this can be a game changer. It's really nice. It's really really neat 
and it can serve you well in so many different garments. And I'm talking about facings. When it comes to facings, oftentimes we think of them in the context of a jacket like this one, for example. I made this for my daughter and as you can see here I used facing on the front to neatly enclose the zipper and I've extended this facing all the way up to the shoulder seam to enclose the beginning of this ribbed neckline. You can see the same treatment that I did on this adult jacket for myself that I made from neoprene. However, I would invite you to think about facings as a more diverse option that definitely can, as I mentioned, save the day. So here's the retro top that I completed a couple years ago. The fabric was particularly challenging to work with due to uh, sort of this textured feel of it. And the top over here is completed with the facing because none of the other solutions worked well enough. So if I turn this wrong side out you will see that here's the facing and I tacked it down with hand sewing stitches and if we turn it to the front you will see exactly the same. You can use facings to complete necklines, you can use facings to complete armholes and you can even do an all-in-one facing to complete these two at the same time, armhole and neckline. And here's an extra tip, you can even do facing on the hem which can provide a really nice and beautiful finish especially if you have a curved hem or or hem with a special design. Let's go ahead and complete the facing on this neckline that has a little V-shape cutout. In my case, this is going to be a hoodie. Here I have prepared my facing. As you can see, it mimics exactly the front and the back necklines. I've also went ahead and I've sewn it at the shoulder seams. Now here I really want to mention a couple of things. Number one, I have self-drafted my own hoodie, therefore the facing is also self-drafted. But let's say you're working with a commercial pattern and it doesn't come with facing but you want to use this technique, then you can surely self-draft your own facing. It's really easy. Number two, this technique is best when used for medium to medium to heavyweight fabrics because if you're using this on a lightweight fabric, a couple of things might happen. Number one, your fabric might be too flimsy for this technique and it's just not going to lay flat and give you the desired result. And number two, lightweight knits oftentimes uh, are slightly see-through or maybe quite a bit see-through and then of course you will be able to see the facing. So definitely choose the right fabric for this technique. First, I want to take my hoodie and I want to interface this little V cutout at the front neckline. Now, you can of course go ahead and interface the entire neckline. I am using knit interfacing, therefore it does stretch, so keep that in mind. Next, I want to take my facing, place it right sides together with my hoodie neckline, and I want to pin it together. Once that is all pinned, I'm going to go to the serger and I will sew it all together. Now, since I mentioned that I'm going to be working with a hoodie, I'm also going to sandwich the hood between the facing as well. Once done, I'm going to turn the facing to the inside of the garment, making sure that it lays nice and flat, give it a really good press if needed. And of course, if you have any sharp corners, if you want those sharp corners, make sure that you turn them out as well. I quite like the rounded shape of mine, so I'm going to leave it as is. Now I'm going to secure the facing to the garment so that way it doesn't flop around. I'll be using two different methods, but you can of course stick just to one depending on what is best for your project. On the front I'm going to use a low flex thread and a straight stitch and I'm going to do two rows of straight stitches quarter of an inch away from the edge and from each other. On the back, however, I will be using a hand sewn needle and thread and I will very lightly attach the back facing to the back pattern piece of my hoodie. On the bottom of the front v-neck shape, I've also tacked it down with hand sewing stitches and because I did use interfacing on the pattern piece of the garment itself, you won't be able to see any puckers that usually appear when you do an invisible stitch on the inside of the garment. When done, you will have a beautiful neckline that was completed in a really nice and neat manner and didn't give you a ton of headache. Now here's a quick reminder, if you are a member of this channel, then you do have a full video tutorial on how to do this facing, the bottom of the jacket, as well as this little ribbing on the neckline as well. And you do have a full separate tutorial on how to do these little zipper pockets in a jacket as well. So definitely check out your members perks and I will leave the links for these members extra videos underneath this one. 
Well, there you have it, my dear sewing friends. All of these techniques have served me really well in my sewing, and I truly hope for the same for you. I tried to give you the best that I could, and I truly hope that it will give you a really great result. Now, if you want to see a video on how I finish woven necklines with also extra tips and tricks and plenty of options, then go ahead and click right over here, and I will see you in that video. Until next time, happy, thoughtful, and creative sewing. I'll see you soon. Bye.